one of the things we discover rather quickly in our study of the Gospel of Mark is that Mark has a stylistic uh, tendency to group fours together. Fours of this and fours of that. For example, the, the first call of the disciples, uh, the apostles in chapter 1, has four uh, apostles that are called, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Then there's a list of four miracles that Jesus performs in chapters 1 and 2. And then, as we get to chapter 12, we see another beautiful set of fours, four questions in this case. It's just kind of a beautiful way of, uh, of showing kind of uh, wholeness and uh, organization uh, throughout the scripture, especially the Gospel of Mark. I'd like to take uh, our prayer from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. It's a little bit lengthy, but it, it revolves around one of the questions that a scribe asks Jesus. And let us try to put ourselves in the scribe's shoes because what he is seeking is wisdom. And that's the, the theme uh, or the, the message of this session, a word to the wise. <laughs> and he's wise and we want to try to be a little bit uh, wise like him. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, that there is no other but he, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Jesus, send us the spirit of wisdom that had touched the heart of that scribe who dared to ask you a question, but was open to learning and growing and drawing closer to you, the source of all wisdom. Uh, help us to grow a little wiser as we study Mark chapter 12. And may the great bishop, martyr, and apostle, not apostle, but evangelist Mark, intercede for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As is our custom, we'll take one step back in order to take two steps forward. And so we review the last session, which was on chapter 11 of the Gospel of Mark, uh, what we called Mountain Men. Why? Why did we call it Mountain Men? Because Jesus has arrived at the Temple Mount. He has arrived in Jerusalem after his journey from Galilee in the north uh, through Samaritan territory and now to the heart of, the, of David's kingdom, Jerusalem, and what is also referred to as Mount Zion, uh, the place where God uh, established a covenant with David and his descendants, and the, and the ultimate and the greatest descendant of all would be Jesus himself, the son of David and the son of God. And so uh, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem in chapter 11. And in chapter 12, we get to uh, this study of wisdom, but I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so let's review uh, what we studied last time in uh, session seven called Mountain Men. Mountain Men. So if you have your study guide and the homework, which was on page 38, you'll take a gander at that. Number one. Two different and distinct mountains in the Bible are Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb. And as I was reviewing my notes uh, to make sure I had the right answers for these, I'm not sure that we discussed that. So if you weren't sure where that came from, my apologies. Uh, please forgive me. Mea culpa, mea culpa. Uh, Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are the same mountain. Uh, it's the mountain that uh, Moses... Uh, sees the burning bush at, referred to as Horeb, and it's the same mountain that 
uh, he receives the Ten Commandments from God. It's also the same mountain in uh, 1 Kings 19 where Elijah uh, has this experience of God in the whispering wind. And so uh, Sinai and Horeb are the same, and so they are not two dis different and distinct mountains, and so number one is false. But give yourself credit if I hadn't gone over that in the last session. Number two, Muslims built the Dome of the Rock over the location where Muhammad is said to have ascended into heaven, and that is true. You might remember that's why that is the third holiest site for Muslims after Mecca and Medina. Uh, so Jerusalem is held in high regard by our Muslim brothers and sisters. Number three, Mount Zion was the location of the establishment of the Mosaic Covenant. And immediately you should know, eh, that is false. Why? Because you had two great covenants in the Old Testament. You had the Mosaic Covenant of Moses on Mount Sinai. And you had the Davidic Covenant of King David on Mount Zion, or Jerusalem. And so number three is false. Number four, Judaism reveres the Temple Mount because it was the site of Abram's sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, and that is true because it was uh, where one of those mountains in that mountain range was Mount Moriah. And that's why Judaism reveres it, among other reasons. So number four is true. Number five, the Jerusalem temple was built directly above the foundation stone. Again, true. And we looked at uh, Jonathan Smith's book about all the different reasons why uh, the foundation stone, the Evan Shetiah, is so significant. Uh, not only to, to Jews and Muslims, but also to us Christians. So number six, one of the traditions surrounding the foundation stone is that, is that was the location of Noah's finding dry ground in Genesis 8, chapter 8, verse 13. And that's true. Again, according to rabbinic tradition, uh, that is where Moses landed uh, with the ark and let all the animals out in kind of a new creation in Genesis chapter 8 and then uh, the, the rainbow appears as the sign of the covenant with Noah. Number seven, Mount Zion is sometimes referred to as the Axis Mundi, or the navel of the world. And so number seven is also true. The Axis Mundi, the axis of the world, kind of the, the central, uh, pivotal point around which everything else revolves, where God's interaction with man reaches its focus uh, and its culmination. And we saw how that is where Adam and Eve and David and then Jesus were all going to perform their greatest uh, functions in relating with God. So number seven is true. Number eight, Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem where Abraham almost sacrificed his son Ishmael. Catch the last word in that sentence. That's what makes it False. Number eight is false. That is not where Abram almost sacrificed his son Ishmael. It was his son Isaac. Number nine. Beneath the foundation stone, beneath the Evan Shetiah, is the well of souls. The well of souls, the symbolic underworld, and that is also true. Number nine. And by the way, you might, uh, to, to get some of the answers to some of these questions, you might look at that. Uh, that picture on page 36, on page 36, you have there, the in yellow, that's the Evan Shetiah, the foundation stone. And below it, you kind of have steps leading down into this area that would be considered the well of souls, the, the symbolic entryway to the underworld, purgatory or Sheol. Okay, so number nine is true. Number 10 Hebrews 12, 18 through 21, which was kind of our launching point for the last session, contrasts Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, the sites of the two great covenants of the Old Testament. I've already said that, so you know the answer to that is true. Bam, bam, done. Finish with the mountain men. Let's get off the mountain <laughs> and let's learn some wisdom. How do you, what do you say to that? Today's 
uh, topic, as I mentioned, is to try to provide some background information for Mark chapter 12. And the way I'm trying to go about it is uh, to frame it in terms of knowledge versus wisdom. Knowledge versus wisdom. And so the background information I'm going to try to connect, <laughs> I'm not sure if, if it'll be successful, but I'm going to try, is to show the, to give some indication and some uh, explanation of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. There are seven books that are considered of the uh, 46 books of the Old Testament that are considered the wisdom books, sapiential literature. Um, and so uh, Mark chapter 12 suggests that because we have these four questions. And one of the questions is asked by a scribe who Jesus recognized as having answered wisely. He answered wisely. He's beginning to grow in wisdom. See, the other questions were not questions aimed at understanding. They were questions aimed at trapping Jesus. They were uh, manipulative questions. They were questions with an ulterior motive to try to make Jesus look bad and ultimately find reasons to kill our Lord. Well, that's not growing in knowledge or wisdom. That's just diabolical. Uh, in contrast to that, you have the scribe who asks a question and tries to grow in wisdom. That's what, that's what we want to imitate. And so uh, I'd like to look at the Old Testament books that are considered the wisdom books uh, because we want to be like the scribe in Mark chapter 12 and answer wisely and think wisely and, and try to be a little wiser if, if the Holy Spirit gives us that gift of wisdom. Uh, to get a running start before we dive right into the seven books, uh, I'd like to share some personal anecdotes uh, about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And sometimes we confuse these two things, don't we? We think the person who has the most knowledge must be the wisest person in the room. But is that always the case? Not necessarily. Not necessarily at all. Uh, the person who is wise is the person who has a kind of insight. Uh, in fact, that was Bernard Lonergan's whole uh, thesis about what does it mean to know. It is a kind of penetration, a penetrating insight, a eureka moment where things suddenly become clear, where the, the, the scales fall from our eyes, the veil is pulled aside, and we see things as they truly are. A moment of insight. A eureka. I get it. Moment. Uh, and, and that is someone who seeks wisdom. That's why chapter 12 ends with Jesus contrasting the knowledge of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the wisdom of a widow who puts in two small copper coins all that she had. It was not a gesture of extravagance. It was a gesture of humility and wisdom recognizing that whatever I have comes from God, and so I return it to God. Uh, and so we have these two great examples, the scribe, a, a rare scribe who seeks wisdom, and this widow at the end of chapter 12, uh, who is also wise in her humility and her generosity. So here are some anecdotes to kind of uh, give us a running start to talk about wisdom. And now I'm on ch page 39 of our study guide, Number two, letter A. We live in the information age. We enjoy great knowledge, but I'm sad to say, little wisdom. <laughs> we could just, we even have a new verb we've created. I'll Google that. And what does that mean? That means I'll just go to the internet and I'll just look it up. And, and the meaning of words and phrases, history, data, ad nauseum is available to us. And, uh, and so we think that that is the information age and the internet is this information superhighway and we're all cruising down the superhighway thinking we're wise. But I would suggest to you that what we really have is a bunch of knowledge, a bunch of information, and we're not necessarily wise. And I want to contrast those two things. I'd like to describe to you what is wisdom and how is it different from simply accumulating a bunch of data points, a bunch of information. Uh, and I'd like to do it by 
suggesting if you haven't had a chance to read this book, read this book, Leisure, The Basis of Culture by Joseph Pieper. This is one of the suggested books uh, that, uh, that I, I thought would be helpful in this session. Letter B, Joseph Pieper wrote after World War II when people were busy rebuilding Europe. It had been decimated after the Axis and the Allies had just uh, torn each other apart. But tempted, but the people were tempted to forget what's more important than work, simply building and rebuilding a nation and a culture, namely leisure. And by leisure, he doesn't just mean laying on a beach and reading some novel. Uh, he means having an attitude of awe and wonder uh, before the creator and creation, just to kind of sit back and look and to look deeply and to try to understand and to begin to ask questions, but questions that really, first of all, acknowledge our ignorance, I don't know, and then to be ready to receive uh, true wisdom uh, from God, from others, from everything from all of creation. That is the first step of wisdom is awe and wonder. What is this like? What is it? Not to assume. <laughs> you know what, what happens if you assume something, you make an ass out of you and me, right? Like the word assume. So don't assume, but stand in awe and wonder. And uh, think about this. Here's what the etymology or the, the word leisure really comes from. And again, I'm borrowing from Joseph Pieper. We are at uh, letter B, number one. For leisure in Greek is skole. That's how you say leisure in Greek. Okay, skole. In Latin, that's translated as skola. In fact, some choirs that sing Gregorian chant are sometimes referred to as skola cantorum, a school of songs, okay, a school of music. The, the choir. It's a school. Skole. <laughs> Leisure. And then that's where the English word school comes from. And so here's his point. School does not, properly speaking, mean school, but leisure. <laughs> you might be thinking, ah, uh, you lost me. Okay, look at it this way. When did people go to school back in the agrarian times? When they had, uh, when they didn't have to be out on the farm, work in the land, when they had to be busy working. And so they were allowed to go to school when there was leisure, when there was nothing, in a sense, important to do like work. So leisure was this, this off time. Okay, if you want, you can go to school and, and study some ABCs and one, two, threes. Uh, but let's get back to work, the more important thing. And so you can see how leisure and school were connected in the agrarian society. We don't look at it like that so much today, but the original meaning or the original meaning of leisure and school were intimately intertwined. Um, let's look at letter C, the word liberal arts versus utilitarian knowledge. Now, going to get into some definitions and connotations of words that, that are going to be different. They're going to be unfamiliar to us. So I'm going to ask you to just kind of step back from your preconceived ideas of the word liberal. What do we usually think of when we, when we hear the word liberal? Oh, he's a, he's a leftist. He's a liberal. But as opposed to a conservative, a right-wing thinker, thinker, right? Liberal versus conservative. Well, forget all that. That is not what we mean when we talk about the liberal arts. What we mean by liberal in that sense is liberty, uh, freedom, not being a slave to work out on the farm, but you have the freedom, the liberty to learn. That's liberal arts. And again, we're going to lean on Joseph Pieper to help us understand the difference between that kind of liberal arts where there is freedom to learn, liberality, liberty, 
versus utilitarian knowledge. Knowledge that you're just getting so you can go get something else. Knowledge like engineering. Knowledge like uh, business. Knowledge like getting a, a CPA so you can go get a job and you can make money. That is utilitarian knowledge. Liberal arts is wisdom. It's knowledge for its own sake. Okay, can you start to see the, see the difference between knowledge as information versus wisdom as a liberal art like philosophy, literature, history, psychology, uh, theology. These subjects you don't learn and then go and get a, a job. <laughs> Usually you have to go get another degree. Uh, a PhD, and then get a job, or you become a priest. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at letter C, number one. Here's Joseph Pieper again from the book Leisure, The Basis of Culture, page 40. The knowledge of the functionary, someone who performs a function, who just has a job to do, a line worker, is not the only kind of knowledge. There is also the knowledge of a gentleman, to use Newman's very happy formula. He's referring to Cardinal John Henry Newman, now Saint Newman, in his book called The Idea of a University, for the terms for the term artis liberales, the liberal arts. Let me, uh, let me just share a, a quick aside here. I studied philosophy uh, at the University of Dallas, and uh, if they don't they don't give uh, a minor, but I took all my extra courses in literature, and these two subjects. Uh, are liberal arts subjects. You graduate from the University of Dallas with a philosophy degree or with a literature degree, you're probably not going to nail a job uh, the day after graduation. Most people with philosophy and literature degrees are going to go get another degree, a teaching certificate, or they're going to go to uh, law school, or they're going to go into some other school where they will learn a trade that then they can go get a job with. And, uh, and so these liberal arts are really for those who have the freedom, the leisure, <laughs> the luxury to study things that are, in a sense, the most important things, but not necessarily something that'll go land you a job the day you walk out with that degree from a university. Uh, in a sense, uh, what you study in the liberal arts are useless things. They don't have an immediate use, so we might think they're useless, but in the, but in the real sense, they are the most important things. Uh, the most important things in life are, in fact, uh, useless, like playing. You ever see children playing? If you ask them, hey, why are you playing? What would they answer you? They would say, we play for the sake of playing. There is no other purpose for playing except itself. It is its own end. You do it for its own sake. So too, uh, the highest form of prayer, contemplation. You don't pray in order to get something. You pray simply to be in the presence of the Lord. You pray for its own sake. You are just there. You're not trying to get something else out of it. You don't use prayer in its, in its best form. So too with love. Love is not supposed to be something you use to, to get something else. Love is its own reward. It is done for its own sake. That's also wisdom. Wisdom is not learned and gained in order to go get something else, go get more money, <laughs> to, uh, to get a great job, to write a lot of books and be famous, although lots of wise people do that. But that's a secondary result or effect of wisdom, not its primary goal, which is simply to enjoy the wisdom itself. It is its own reward. Those are useless things because you don't use them like a tool to achieve something else. It is its own end. 
Anyway, I'll give you a couple more examples before we get into the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So I hope you're beginning to look at knowledge and wisdom in, in a very different ways. They are very distinct, profoundly distinct. Letter D, uh, why versus how questions. Some questions you ask are how did that happen? How is this going to work? Those are questions that seek knowledge, information. When you ask a why question, why did he do that? Why are you here? Why are you studying the Gospel of Mark? You are asking wisdom questions. They are kind of an end in themselves. Or, look, look, here's some other example. An optometrist, someone who has a job, looks into a woman's eyes and sees the cornea and the iris and the pupil. That's great. Very important job. But someone who loves that woman looks into a woman's eyes and sees into her soul. And in it, the whole world. Who sees more? Who sees more? One may have a lot of knowledge, the optometrist. The other is beginning to gain wisdom. Something that is gained for its own sake. The optometrist gets a paycheck. <laughs> uh, the one who is in love has wisdom about another person. And that is its, its own paycheck, its own reward. Some people hate my homilies on Sundays because I don't tell them what to do. And right now I'm giving a series of eight homilies. I'm not sure when you're watching uh, this video, uh, but I'm recording it right before the 2020 presidential election. And I'm discussing different topics of very great moment uh, for Catholics to consider. And I'm trying to get uh, parishioners to think more deeply about it, to think more wisely about these things. I'm not telling them, vote Republican, vote Democrat. And you know what? Some people are frustrated. <laughs> They're like, why don't you just tell us what to do, Father John? And I'm like, no way, Jose, no way. I want you to learn to think. I want you to learn to be wise, ask questions. Uh, and so, um, number three, again, a quotation from Pieper, the considerations put forward in this essay were not designed to give advice or draw up a line of action. They were, to, they were meant to make men think. That's the purpose of wisdom, to be in wonder and awe before God and his creation and just say, wow. Okay, now let's look at the sapiential literature of the Old Testament. And we have to switch whiteboards. So, and I'm not going to go into any great depth, but I am going to kind of go uh, skimming across the top like we're skiing. Uh, on, a, on snow skis or water skis. Uh, so you have the word sapiential literature, which is the same as wisdom literature. So this comes from the Latin word sapientia, which means wisdom. So there are seven books in the Old Testament that are considered in this category, in this grouping of Old Testament books. They are Job, and I put here how many chapters each of the books has. I don't know why. I just like to know how many chapters are in each of the books of the Bible. So I've tried to make it a point to try to remember. Oh, there are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. There are 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. There are 40 chapters in the book of Exodus. There are 32 chapters in the book of Deuteronomy and, and so on and so forth. I try to remember books by how many chapters. It's very helpful. It's very helpful. Uh, so Job has 42 chapters. Uh, the book of Psalms has 150, you can call them chapters, or 150 psalms. The book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. And the 31st chapter, many people are familiar with because it is the, the ode to the virtuous wife. If you ever uh, are looking for a great scripture passage on just how great 
uh, the, a woman, a wife, a mother uh, can be, how she is praised to the moon, uh, just check out Proverbs chapter 31. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. And fantastic. Both for you men and women who are looking for what is the best that the scripture has to offer, at least in the Old Testament, for uh, the ideal wife, mother, woman. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31, worth your money. Okay, Ecclesiastes has 12 chapters in it. You might remember Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 10 or 11, is where it talks about there is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot the plant a time of war and a time of peace, a time to love and a time to hate, so on and so forth. Chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes. Wisdom. Wisdom. The Song of Solomon, also called the Song of Songs, sometimes. The Song of Solomon only has eight chapters. Very beautiful and very uh, erotic. Love poetry. Erotic, even. Very sensual, very intimate. Uh, and so it's not often read uh, at Mass. Um, and so, but definitely part of our wisdom. Love. It is about love. And that is something you don't do for the sake of something else. You do it for its own sake. It is not useful. It is useless because it is not to be used. Love is not to be used for something else. You just are in awe that you are in love with someone else. It is its own reward. So, Song of Solomon fits in this category of sapiential literature. It is not knowledge. It is not just information. Okay, okay, okay. You get the point. Number uh, Wisdom has 19 chapters. And Sirach, also called Ben Sirah, also called Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiasticus means a little book of the church to be used for those in the church, instructions of how to live in the church. So Sirach has a lot of chapters, 51 chapters. Only uh, Psalms has more Psalms or chapters than Sirach. You might notice that I've got two asterisks by uh, wisdom and Sirach. Can anybody guess why I have two asterisks by Wisdom and Sirach and not next to Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon or Song of Songs? You might remember uh, there were seven books in the Old Testament that were eliminated by the Hebrew uh, scribes and Pharisees uh, in the early centuries before Christ. And thereby we came up with the Hebrew Bible. At the same time, the first few centuries before Christ, in Alexandria in Egypt, you had also Jewish scribes and Pharisees putting together a list of books of the Old Testament that included those seven books. And so you had two versions of the Hebrew Bible. One with seven books less, and another with those seven books included. And these two are among those disputed seven books. Uh, and you might remember our little mnemonic device to help us remember what those seven books are. The wise Jews slipped banishing 1st and 2nd Maccabees. The Tobit. Wise. Wisdom. Jews. Judith slipped Sirach banishing Baruch the secretary of the prophet Jeremiah, and First and Second Maccabees. So we have an asterisk next to Wisdom and Sirach because those are two of the disputed books of the Old Testament. Okay, so there you have them with their chapters. Doesn't that make you feel better knowing how many chapters? It makes me feel so good. Okay, We are at the bottom of page 39, folks. Let's cherry pick a few interesting details out of each of these seven books. And now we are going to turn to our old friends, Bergsma and Petrie, in the sitbot. They have a beautiful introduction to the sapiential literature. And I'm going to be using some quotations from that. Okay, we're at number three, letter A. The books considered wisdom literature in the Old Testament are, we just named them, 
Sirach is also called Ecclesiasticus. Song of Solomon is sometimes called Song of Songs. And notice what the Sitvat says on page 533, the next quotation. The concern in the sapiential literature is to convey not information. We're not on the information superhighway, folks. Turn off the internet. Turn it off. Get out of the car. Get out of the speedster. We are going to slow down. We're going to stop. We're going to stand in awe and wonder before the Creator and His creation. Uh, it's not information about past events, historical books. There is a part of the Bible that concentrates on that. But guidance for wise living. We've already started talking about that. This, we're we're going to get into the details. you got to slow me down sometimes. you got to slow me down. All right. Let's look at the first one. Job, out of the Old Testament, has 42 chapters. Is the shows Job is kind of a uh, second Adam who did not fall. This is uh, Adam underwent a test. And now Job undergoes a test, but he doesn't give in. He, you know the story about Job, right? I mean, Satan uh, persecutes and torments him, not only uh, making him lose his family and his livelihood, his fortune, but also his body is uh, filled with sores. Uh, and he undergoes this test. But unlike Adam, Job remains faithful to God. He does not disobey God or turn his back on God. And so in that sense, he becomes a kind of Christ figure in anticipation of Jesus. So we read from the Sitbot, In the living tradition of the church, Job's trials will become a type and anticipation of the passion of Jesus. Jesus, too, will be uh, persecuted and even destroyed in death, crucified on the cross. And yet he does not deny God. He remains faithful to the Father and fulfills his will. The definitive new Adam, what Adam should have done, what Job did in a sort of preliminary way, Christ does in perfection. That's from the Sitpot, page 534. At root in the book of Job is a wisdom question. Why? Notice the why question, not how. Do we deal with suffering? But why do we suffer? Asking a liberal arts question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Notice the why in that question. Okay, now let's look at Psalms, the book of Psalms. Our hymns of praise for God's covenant faithfulness to David. I'm reading from the Sitbot here. No, I'm sorry, I'm, this is my own. <laughs> but also in anticipation of the future son of David, Jesus. Uh, now, turn the page, please, to page 40. The Psalter presents a spirituality of prayer and praise that is grounded on the promises of the Davidic covenant. We talked about that. And radically open to the fulfillment of those promises made in the new covenant. See, especially Psalm 89. You can look that up yourself. Uh, the Psalms, the 150 Psalms of the Old Testament, was Jesus' prayer book. And it should be our prayer book. You should read the Psalms regularly. We sing the Psalms, a responsorial psalm at every Mass. It's always from one of the 150 Psalms. This is the book that all deacons, priests, and obviously bishops make a promise to pray when they are ordained. The Liturgy of the Hours. I, I use the French version of the Liturgy of the Hours, La Liturgie des Heures. And uh, I, I don't speak French fluently or anything, but I can read it. I can kind of muddle my way through it. And also because... I've been reading the Psalms in English for so many years, you know, I can pretty much uh, guess what the Psalms are. Uh, and I know enough French to be able to, to actually pray it, which is the point. So those were Jesus' uh, prayer book, the Psalter, the Psalms. And so we should have a deep love for the Psalms. It touches every aspect of human life. In a particular way, it helps us understand God's love and faithfulness to David and the covenant that he that he cut with him on Mount Zion and how Jesus fulfills it and how we are invited to be part of it. It's so important to read the Psalms in that spirit of God's covenant faithfulness to David and our need to be faithful to that covenant. Okay, the next three we can kind of lump together.
Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. These wisdom books serve the same function in the Davidic covenant as the legal collections in Exodus through Deuteronomy serve in the Mosaic covenant. Recall our discussion about Mount Sinai, the covenant God cut with Moses, the Ten Commandments, and then God's covenant with David on Mount Zion in Jerusalem that included not only a covenant with all Israel, but with all the nations, including me and you. Thanks to the Davidic covenant, we're included in God's uh, family. And so what you have in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon is a law uh, for everyone. What, what Moses received in the Ten Commandments was for the nation of Israel, limited to them. What David received in the wisdom literature was kind of equivalent to the law of Moses, but intended for everyone. And so we read, in number one there, both give a law that embody divine wisdom, just like the laws of a household embody parental wisdom of your family. You have laws in your home. You do this, you do that. You, curfews at this time, everybody eats dinner together, and you have to do your homework before you go play, and so on and so forth. We get to Mass on Sunday. Uh, those laws are an embodiment of the wisdom of the parents. And so the laws of Moses and the laws of David and Solomon embody the wisdom of God. And so again, from the Sitbot, page 535, For if fear of the Lord is wisdom's beginning, the love of the Lord is wisdom's end. And, and speaking of love, a beautiful the story about uh, St. Thomas Aquinas as he lay dying on his deathbed. He asked that this book, only eight chapters, be read uh, to him in its entirety because uh, he felt he was about to meet his maker, the one he had loved so intensely and grown to not just to know but to uh, stand in awe before in wisdom. Now he's preparing to meet him and he wanted to just uh, savor the Song of Solomon, this erotic love poetry of the Old Testament. Then Sirach is the last book, 51 chapters, or Ecclesiasticus. Here there is, again from the Sitbot, here there is a comprehensive integration of natural law, revealed law, sacred worship, and salvation history. You got a little, little kit and caboodle of everything. The author of Sirach finds the highest expression of God's universal wisdom manifested in the law, in the liturgy, and the history of the people of Israel. With good reason, this book is also called Ecclesiasticus, that is, the little book of the church, as I was saying earlier, because it was so widely used in fundamental catechesis in the early centuries. Basically, read this, and you know what we do as Christians. Uh, Sirach. Let's try to sum up a little bit here, because I also want to share with you uh, the, the little extra handout there on page 41. The poetic books of the Old Testament constitute arguably the church's most treasured collection. I'm just reading from the Sitbot. Within the scriptures of Israel, they include, one, the book most often read, sung, and prayed in the church's rhythm of liturgical prayer, the Psalms. Okay. Two, the book most widely used for training pagan nations in Judeo-Christian morality, Sirach. And three, the book used most extensively in antiquity for sacramental mystagogy, the Song of Solomon. After you become a Christian, you've received the sacraments, what's next? Well, falling more deeply in love with Christ. And where do we learn how to love the Lord in the way that he himself has revealed through his sacred word in the Song of Solomon? in that erotic uh, love poetry. Uh, that's how we grow in that marital communion with Christ. Uh, so here's a little way to kind of explain that. Uh, the mechanics of the Mass, you know, people want to know, okay, when do we stand, when do we kneel, when do we sit, when do we make the sign of the cross, uh, are important. But that's not the whole reason for going to Mass, just to get all that right. It's not about the how ultimately, but it leads to the why are we at Mass? We are going to be united, body and soul, 
one flesh union, as in marriage, only symbolized in marriage, but really real in communion, in sacramental communion, which is far more important. So when you go to Mass, don't worry so much about the how. Of course, you got to know what to do. You don't want to look foolish. You don't want to be standing when everybody else is sitting. But be far more concerned about the why. That's wisdom. Why are you at Mass? Not just, when do we have to go? What time is it going to be over? How long is it going to be? The how questions. Ask the why question. Begin to grow in wisdom. Like that scribe in Mark chapter 12. The other books of the Old Testament teach the how of salvation. Very important, no doubt about it. The wisdom literature will teach you the why. These seven books. The sapiential literature is like the liberal arts of the Old Testament. The knowledge of a gentleman. <laughs> we might say in Newman's happy phrase. Now, let's re look really quickly at these <laughs> kind of interesting uh, little uh, facts, fun facts. As uh, our seminarian here this past summer, Ben Riley, likes to say, fun facts. Uh, just real quick here. Uh, look at those and we'll go through it. Number one, every minute about 50 Bibles are sold. Can you imagine? 50 Bibles uh, are sold. So if you have a gift shop, be sure to have lots of Bibles because people are buying them like hotcakes. Okay. Number two, the world's best-selling book, the Bible, is also the world's most shoplifted books. Now, how bad off do you have to be to shoplift the Bible? I mean, what are you doing? What are you doing? Maybe they're going to turn around and sell it because they know people want to buy it. I don't know. Strange, but fun fact. Number three, amen is the last word of the Bible. That's true. You can look it up. There are 22 chapters at the end of chapter 22 of Revelation. Number four, lions are mentioned 55 times in the Bible. Dogs, 14 times. Cats, not at all. Sorry, cat lovers. No cats in the Bible. Cats in the cradle. Cats not in the Bible. Remember that. Number five, only three times in the Bible the word Christian appears. In Acts 11 and 26 and in 1 Peter 4, 16. Number six, the only book in the Bible that does not contain the word God is Esther. Poor Queen Esther. Number seven, there are 31,173 verses divided into 1,189 chapters in the 66 books of the Bible. Eh. Obviously, this fun fact was put together by the Protestants because we believe there are 73 books in the Bible. The wise Jews slipped banishing 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Don't forget, wisdom in Sirach. So mark out 66, write in 73. And obviously that changes the, the, the verses and chapters as well. Number eight, the shortest book chapter is Psalm 117. We talked about the Psalms, 150 Psalms. And the longest is Psalm 119. Number nine, the center verse is Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to, to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Amen. But we do the opposite all the time. Seven suicides are recorded in the Bible. The most famous one, of course, is Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. It takes around 70 hours to read the Bible straight through. Wow. Number 12, it probably feels like 70 hours every session. This <laughs> marked the way Bible study. All right, that's not funny. Okay, number 12, the word grandmother appears in the Bible only one time in 2 Timothy 1.5. The word trinity does not appear in the Bible, although if you look at the, the very last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, you have a reference to the trinity. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right there, bam, holy trinity. Number 14, the word Lord appears 6,781 times in the Bible. There are 1,260 promises in the Bible. And uh, all fun facts. But the most important thing is not to know a lot of knowledge, but to begin to grow in wisdom. Let's pray for that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Gospel of Mark and chapter 12, where the evangelist helps us to Consider four questions, one of which shows that the questioner was growing in wisdom. 
Help us to do the same as we study Mark, as we uh, contemplate your word. Hear all these prayers that we make through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. Mark the Evangelist, Bishop and Martyr, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.